as we talked about before, different aqueous solutions have different types of solutes in them. And one of the most important things is to figure out exactly how much solute you have. We're going to use a measure that is an intensive property, which means that it's independent of the solution volume. And this is what we call concentration or more commonly known as molar concentration or molarity. There are other units of concentration that you will encounter in chemistry, but molarity is one of the ones that we use most often, especially in general chemistry. The way you calculate the molarity is you divide the number of moles of your solute by the volume of the solution that you have, with one molar equal to one mole of solute over one liter of a solution. Why is it important to know concentration? Well, because chemical reaction turns out depends a lot on concentration. If the concentration is high, then the chemical reaction occurs both faster as well as to a larger extent. And if it's lower concentration, the opposite happens. So one of the things that you need to do is just know how to calculate molarity if you are given volume and number of moles or convert them to number of moles. So let's take a look at a question about molarity or molar concentration. It's asking what's the molar concentration of a solution that has 10.3 grams sodium bromide in 251 milliliter of the solution. The key here is to remember that definition of molarity where one molar, which has the unit capital M, is equal to one mole per liter. So what we need to figure out is convert the units to moles per liter and that would be the molarity. So the first thing is to take this to number of moles since we have grams right now we have to calculate the number of moles of NABR and that's just 10.3 grams over the molar mass of NABR which ends up being 102.894 grams per mole and that would give us 0.100103 moles of NABR. Now we need to figure out what the volume is and it has to be in units of liter so the volume is 251 milliliter but of course to convert that to liter, it will end up being 0.251 liter. So then the molarity of NABR that we're given is just going to be 0.100103 moles over 0.251 liter, and that would give us 0.399. And then moles per liter, which can just be written as molar. The other important concept is dilution. Dilution has to do with taking something that has a high molarity and converting them to something with lower molarity. Another way we can say that is we're taking a concentrated solution and converting them to a dilute solution. And the way you do this is you add solvent. If you don't change the quantity of solute you have, all you're doing is just adding more water to your original solution. Now, if you're just adding water, then what really happens is of course, that the number of moles of your solute doesn't change. In other words, before the dilution, which is when you have the concentrated solution, the number of moles should equal after the dilution. Now, given the definition of molarity, which is number of moles over volume, that means to calculate number of moles, you can multiply molarity times volume. And that's why we have this equation for dilution, which is most often written as M1V1 equals to M2V2. V2, or I like to present it this way, where it's molarity of the concentrated solution times the volume of the concentrated solution equals the molarity of the diluted solution times the volume of the diluted solution. Okay, let's take a look at an example of a dilution problem. We have a 122 milliliter sample of a 1.2 molar sucrose solution, which is diluted to 500 milliliter. And the question is, what's the molarity of the diluted solution? So it's always useful to have a drawing so you can imagine what the problem looks like. You originally have 122 milliliter, 1.2 molar solution, and it's diluted. So that means you're adding water to this until the volume now after you add the water is 500 milliliter. So the question is the new concentration. This is really the, a straight application of your dilution equation, which is M1V1 equals M2V2. We're trying to find the molarity of the diluted solution. So we need M2, which means we can divide both sides by V2, and that would isolate M2 to be M1V1 over V2. And all we need to do here 
is put in our values of M1, which is 1.2 molar, V1, which is 122 milliliter, and V2, which is 500 milliliter. Now, in some cases, I often see students like to change the unit of the volume to liters. In this case, it's really not necessary because as you can see, the units will get canceled out. So whether you change it to liter or you keep it in milliliters, it would still get canceled out. The concern is when you change it to liter, sometimes people make a mistake in the conversion and that causes you to get the wrong answer. When you do the calculation, you should get 0.293 molar, which makes sense. That's a smaller concentration than your starting value of 1.2 molar. Now we had talked earlier about the fact that aqueous compounds don't always break up the same way. If you have ionic compounds, they actually break apart into ions. And when you have covalent compounds, they stay together. In both cases, the solutes get surrounded by a lot of water molecules, but the way they're being surrounded and the way they're being dissolved is different. So when you have an ionic compound, then you're gonna have to be a little careful in writing your equations for any aqueous reaction. So there's actually three different ways we we can write equations for ionic compound dissolved in water. They're undergoing reactions. The molecular or the formula equation is just writing the complete formula like shown here. So in this case, I have silver acetate reacting with potassium chromate to form silver chromate, which is a solid, and then potassium acetate. So I'm just writing the entire formula just like I would in all the equations that you've seen so far. Now the total ionic equation is an equation where you separate out all the ionic substances that are in solution. In other words, everything with an AQ next to them has to be separated into positive and negative ions. Why? Because as we discussed in a prior video, the real picture of these ionic compounds when they're dissolved in water is they are existing as cations and anions surrounded by water. So if we want to write the equation correctly, we should write it as ions that are separated with the AQ symbol. In the total ionic equation, what I've done here is take the silver, separate it out from the acetate. I put a two in front of both because there's a two coefficient at the beginning of each of these ions. And then for the potassium chromate, I did the same thing, except in this case, the, there are two potassium ions, but the chromate ion itself already has a negative two charge, so it's just one of it. On this side, Notice that the solid doesn't get separated. Why? Because solids stay together. That's the picture that we saw before, right? If it's a solid, it actually looks like this. It doesn't get separated like these AQ species right here. So when you have a solid, you're gonna have to write it just like your formula as you usually write them. And then again, here you have another AQ species. So you're gonna separate those AQ species out into cations and anions. The net ionic equation is the equation where you remove what we call spectator ions. What are spectator ions? They are ions that look the same in the reactant side and the product side. So if I look at my total ionic equation, I notice that my K plus is present on the reactant side, but it's also present on the product side, and they're both two. So because they look exactly identical, that means that in that reaction, nothing really happens to K plus. It's just present in the solution, but it doesn't really participate in the reaction. So to simplify my equation, I can cancel those species out. Very important to understand that doesn't mean that they don't exist. They do exist, but they're not important for the chemistry that is going on, okay? And the other species ions that have the same type of function, which is a spectator ion, is these acetate ions right here. You can cancel those out as well. Once I cross out all of those, then what remains is just the silver and then the chromate and then the silver chromate solid. And this is what we call our net ionic equation. It's just the equation showing the ions that are involved in the reaction itself. A quick note here that in addition to solid, the other species that you want to write together and not separate it are species in the liquid state as well as species in the gas phase. So let me show you an example of how to 
complete a question where you have to write all the different form of the equation. In this case, the molecular, the complete ionic, and the net ionic equation. So I'm going to pick one of these here, iron 2 chloride and cesium hydroxide. So the first thing is you write what the reactants are. So iron 2 chloride would be FeCl2, and then cesium hydroxide would be Cs. OH. And the products would be a double displacement product. So I'm going to swap and put the Fe with the OH and then put the Cs with the Cl. So Cs, Cl, and FeOH. Now, next thing I have to remember is the charges. So Cs, if you look up the periodic table, is a group one. So it has a charge of plus one. Chloride is a minus one. So that means that formula is correct. So we don't need to add any subscript. Fe in the original compound is iron 2, so it has a charge of plus 2. Hydroxide is a minus 1 polyatomic ion. So in this case, to make this formula correct, I'm going to have to have 2 hydroxide. We put parentheses and put 2 right here. That's my formula. Now I need to figure out what kind of state it has. Since this is a double displacement reaction and it's not acid base, the reason I know it's not acid base is because an acid would have had an H at one of the reactants and we don't see that. I'm going to need to go to my solubility rules to figure out what is the state of each of these products. So here's my solubility rules on the left. I can see that CS is a group 1 salt. So if it's group 1, that means that it will be soluble. So AQ. FeOH2, I'm going to scroll down here to find either Fe or OH. And I notice there's an OH here at the bottom. It's always insoluble with some exception, which are these guys. But iron is not one of the exceptions. So in this case, that will be a solid. So that's my molecular equation. Now, one thing I need to do is make sure that I balance my equation after I write the molecular equation by adding 2 to the CSCL and 2 to the CSOH. So now I'm ready to do my complete ionic equation. I'm just going to take anything that's aqueous and separate them out into ions and then keep everything else together. So I have FeCl2 aqueous. I'm going to write Fe2 plus aqueous and 2Cl minus aqueous. I have CSOH aqueous. I have 2 in the front as the coefficient. So that means I have 2 Cs plus and 2 OH minus, both aqueous. I have 2 CSCl aqueous. So that's 2 Cs. Cs plus aqueous and 2Cl minus aqueous. And lastly, I have FeOH2, which is a solid. So what I have there is my complete ionic equation. At this point, what I need to do is highlight my spectator ions and cancel them out. So I can see that Cl minus exists in both sides of the equation, and it's the same number, so I'm going to cancel those out. Cesium also exists in both sides of the equation, so I'm going to cancel that out as well. That leaves me with my net ionic equation, which is just Fe2 plus aqueous plus 2OH minus aqueous forming FeOH2 solid.